talking all about money. Money has history. It can be art and money has value. Someone somewhere decided how much value these coins were worth and people exchange them for something that's worth the same value to them. What's something that has value to you? It could be a person, maybe it's a thing, or maybe it's time. Have you ever heard the saying that time is money? That means that the time you spend doing something like this or like this, it's all valuable. I think it's interesting that some of the least expensive stuff I own is the stuff I value the most. You might be the same way. So as we talk all about money, remember, it's not about having a little or a lot of it. It's about using what you have wisely. Calling all passengers for boarding flight LDD 817. Living on Earth may be expensive, but at least it comes with a free annual trip around the sun. Shel Silverstein has a poem in his book, Where the Sidewalk Ends, that starts like this. My dad gave me one dollar bill, cause I'm his smartest son. And I swapped it for two shiny quarters, cause two is more than one. Does that sound right to you? Who has more? The person with one dollar bill or the person with two quarters? Like we learned earlier, money relies on value, how much it's worth, not just quantity. And one dollar is worth 100 cents while two quarters are only worth 50. All of these piles equal to $1, 100 pennies, 20 nickels, 10 dimes, 4 quarters, 2 50 cent pieces, and $1 coins. Let's take a look at these coins and bills. All of these are equal to 1. Are they worth the same? Here we have 1 Jordanian dinar, 1 Moldovan lu, 1 Peruvian sole, 1 euro, 1 euro cent, 1 South African rand, 1 New Zealand dollar, 1 Ukrainian hryvnia, 1 Swiss franc, 1 Icelandic krona, 1 Canadian dollar, 1 British pound, 1 Mexican peso, 1 Nicaraguan cordoba, and 1 penny and 2 US $1 coins. The unit of measure is also important here. If you go to a store where everything is $1, how much do you have to hand the cashier? This is another time when one does not actually mean one. There are exceptions for some things like groceries, but usually when you buy something, you have to pay a sales tax. The money that governments get from sales tax helps them to provide services to people like safe roads, crime prevention, and even library services. The combination of state and local taxes in Texas is almost always 8.25%. Let's calculate the sales tax for something that costs $1. 8.25% as a decimal is 0 0.0825, so we'll multiply 1 times 0 0.0825. Of course, anything times 1 is itself. Let's try it with something a little more complicated. Let's say I want to buy a toy that's $19.99. To calculate the tax, I would multiply times 0 0.0825. Then I could add $19.99 to get my total. Or to make it easier, I can just multiply times 1.0825, that's 100% of the price, adding the sales tax, which is 8.25%. To be really good with money, you have to develop your math skills. One for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, so go can't go, come on. Some people call it dough and others call it dinero. But whatever you want to call it, we know that we need at least a little bit of money to buy the things we need to survive. Now I'm sure you can't wait until you're an adult so that you can splurge money on whatever you want, whenever you want it. But have you ever thought about what money is, where it comes from, and why it's so valuable? Would you believe me if I told you that money tells the story about history of civilizations? Let's take a look at this $1 bill. The front of the $1 bill shows our very first president in the United States, George Washington. And the $5 bill also bears presidents from the past, Abraham Lincoln. Our money illustrates important leaders in history. And some leaders like Benjamin Franklin and Hamilton weren't even presidents at all. However, they played a profound role in shaping the United States. Our money also shows important places and times in history. The back of the rare $2 bill shows the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the $5 bill shows the Lincoln Memorial, and the back of the $20 bill shows the White House. 
Did you know that there was a time when money didn't even exist at all? Have you ever been in recess and wanted to play with, let's say, a ball because you were super tired of jump roping, but there was already kids playing with all the balls, so you had to find a kid willing to trade you their ball for your jump rope? What you just did is barter, and this is exactly what people did before money existed. People traded livestock, like cows and sheep, in exchange for other things that they needed. If you were lost on a deserted island, what would you need to help you survive? Many people would probably say that they would need food, tools to create shelter and tools to get food, and a fire to cook their food. Very few of us would say money. So if we don't need money all the time, why does money have any value at all? This answer has three parts. First, money has value because it's a legal way to pay for things and it's the official currency of the United States. Second, money gets its value because we all believe as a group that our money is worth something. We perceive that this paper is more valuable than this paper. How unhappy would you be if the tooth fairy suddenly put copy paper underneath your pillow? And third, money gets its value based on how much money is around or not around. It's like having a favorite toy. If you lost your favorite toy, it probably wouldn't matter to you so much if you had 100 of the same toy to replace the one that you lost. And the United States doesn't create a lot of money to simply hand out to everyone because then the money would lose its value just like that toy. Money can buy a lot of things, but using your own talent and ideas as an entrepreneur can be even more rewarding than simply having money. An entrepreneur is a dreamer and a doer. They think of a concept for a business and then make the effort to organize and create it. Many products you see and use every day came from the idea of an entrepreneur and you can be one too. Do you like to eat candy but don't like going to the dentist? Well, 15 year old Elena Morris created her own sugar-free candy brand when she was just seven years old. Entrepreneurs start their business with an idea. And let's pretend that we have the idea to start a lemonade brand like 15-year-old Michaela Ulmer did when she was 11. Entrepreneurs sometimes have to spend their own money or get a loan to buy the supplies they need. We can do chores around the house to make the money or we can ask our parents for a loan and give the money back to them after we've made money from our lemonade sales. We've gone to the store and purchased our supplies and our grand total is $10. The next thing entrepreneurs do is figure out how many people can be served with the supplies they have. And this will tell us how much we need to charge per cup of lemonade. This part of creating the business will help us practice our math. Since the supplies cost us $10 and we can fill 20 cups, it will cost us 50 cents to make each cup. But you don't wanna just charge your customers exactly what you spent because you'll end up with $10 again. Remember, we want to be able to make enough money to save for later, spend on the small things we want, and purchase more supplies to keep our business going. Okay, so you have a great tasting drink and you know what to charge. Now it's time to ask ourselves other basic business questions. Where and when should we sell our lemonade? And how do we stand out from our competition? This is where we'll be able to learn and practice creativity with marketing and practice our public speaking skills. Create a cool poster for your lemonade stand and get permission from mom or dad to speak to everyone who passes by telling them why they should purchase your lemonade. Now that we have a great sign and we know what to tell our customers, the last business question we have to figure out deals with cash handling. How do we store the money that we receive and what happens if a customer needs change? We can gather $1 bills and coins to give to our customers and then store all of our money in something simple, like a Ziploc bag. Now it's time to go out and sell. In the end, money is important and it can buy lots of things, but it can't buy everything. And if you choose to be an entrepreneur, the skills you receive from creating your own business are just as valuable as the money you can make. With all this talk about money, remember, the best rewards are free. I'm coming to you today with a wonderful book recommendation. The book is entitled Landon's Lemonade Stand written by Randy Williams. This book is about a young boy named Landon that sees his favorite bike on TV. So of course he has to have it. So he asks his parents if they're willing to get it for him. Both Landon's parents are business owners 
and they see this as a perfect opportunity to teach Landon about entrepreneurship. An entrepreneur is someone that starts and runs their own business. So the parents give Landon the idea of starting a lemonade stand to earn the money to buy the bike. Does he get his bike? You'll have to tune in and see. This book will be available at Fort Worth Public Libraries. Thank you for joining me and be sure you pick up a copy of Landon's Lemonade Stand, written by Randy Williams. Have you ever seen money that's not from the United States? Let's use this fancy globe to see where different currencies are used around the world. In the United States, we use the dollar. Canada also uses the dollar, the Canada dollar. Mexico uses pesos. South Africa uses rand. 19 countries in Europe use the euro. The United Kingdom uses pounds sterling. Russia uses ruble. India uses rupees. Korea uses yuan and Japan uses yen. But that's just a few examples. There are many countries around the world and many of them have their own unique money or currency. I have been collecting foreign money for a long time. Here is some of my collection. You may have seen this one before. It's the US dollar. This is three rubles from the Russian Soviet Union from 1961. This is a Japanese fourth rupee from the 1940s. This is a Cambodian real. And here is a five euro. When I look at foreign money, I like to compare them. What is the same? They're all rectangles. What is different? The age of the money. This is one from the 1940s and it looks it. It's torn and the material is very flimsy. If you want, you can pause the video and compare these types of currency or money. What is the same? What is different? Looking at this money has made me think, how is money made? Money doesn't grow on trees, you know? Has anyone ever told you that? Well. How is money made then? I did a little research and I found some answers for us. In the US, we have a couple of different kinds of money. We have green bills and several kinds of coins. Our money is made in a place called the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. It's part of the Treasury Department. Paper money is printed in six different locations across the country and it's green because about 160 years ago, that color was really hard to replicate. People used to try and make fake dollars and use them to buy real goods. Now this is called counterfeiting and is against the law. One of the ways it was done was people used to take photos of the money, but it stopped working when the money started being green because photos were only black and white back then. Today, we have much fancier ways to make sure the money is real, so a photo won't work now either. <laughs> you may have heard of the other place that creates money. It's called the Mint, and it's also part of the Treasury Department. The Mint's job is to make all of our pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, and half dollars. Now, the Mint doesn't just put random things on a coin. No, the process of making a coin starts with an artist who creates the image on the computer. Then, someone creates a real-life version. Once they have the image set, they go through a few different presses before they get to the final one. They heat the prepared disks of metal up, press them into shape, and then wash and dry them. Our coins are made up of a mix of metals, partly to keep them strong and durable, and partly because certain metals have become more precious over time. Pennies are made of copper and zinc. Nickels, dimes, and quarters are all made of cupronickel. This is a red envelope called a lisi. We traditionally fill these envelopes with money and give them to children during the Lunar New Year, or thut. This means good luck, and we often say, which means Happy New Year. 
My family is Southern Vietnamese, but we have a lot in common with other Asian countries. Did you know that other countries such as Cambodia, the Philippines, and China also share red envelopes? It's also in other countries, except a little different. In Malaysia and Indonesia, practicing Muslims give green envelopes to people for the holiday of Aid al-Fatir. In South Korea and Japan, they give white envelopes. In general, the connecting meaning of all the envelopes is to share good fortune. There are many associations with the different amounts of money in the envelope. I grew up receiving a lot of $2 bills. Usually, new money is highly valued because it signifies a new year. It's common to see long lines outside of banks around the Lunar New Year because people are trying to get the new crisp dollars. Did you know that in China, there is a widespread tradition that money should not be given in the amount of fours, such as 4, 44, or 444? Because the pronunciation of the word four, si, sounds like the same as the word death. Si wang. Normally, the amount of money in an envelope is an even number because that's considered lucky. Except for the number nine, that number is extra lucky. The number nine in both Chinese and Vietnamese cultures signifies the largest digit. And that's why you see a lot of Asian businesses with the number nine in its name. If you ever go to an Asian business's grand opening day, you might see a mua lung. That is a lion dancer. No, it's not a real lion. Inside, there are trained martial arts dancers. I remember feeding them red envelopes, and that means good luck. Kids around the world receive gifts in different ways. How do you receive gifts from your family? Coin collecting has been called the hobby of kings because it was a luxury only royalty could afford. But over the years, coin collecting has become more accessible. Today, just about anyone can participate in the hobby of kings. Coins are interesting because they've been used all over the world and there are so many different kinds that still exist. A lot of people who collect coins now do it as amateurs just for the fun of it. Others are professional coin dealers or scholars. If there's a historian, museum curator, or an archaeologist that has a question about a coin, they'll go to an expert numismatist to authenticate the coins. A numismatist is a person who studies or collects money. If you want to be a numismatist or start collecting coins, the simplest way is to save coins that you find in circulation. In the library and in coin collecting, we use the term circulation. Circulation is like a circle. It goes around like how a book can go around to all the people who want to read it and how money can go around depending on who spends it and who gets it back as change. You might start a coin collection by looking for coins in circulation that are from the year you were born or by saving a coin from special places that you visit like a souvenir. Or you could just collect coins that you find to be beautiful. Maybe they all have birds or boats on them, whatever you like. When coins stop being used, they're not in circulation anymore. People don't see them as much, so they become more rare, and most of the time they also become more valuable. Another thing that makes coins rare is if the mint made a mistake when it printed it. They probably caught the mistake and corrected it, so usually there ends up only being a few coins that have the error. Let's look at some other qualities that make coins more valuable. Coins get grades, kind of like how you get grades in school. Their grades depend on their eye appeal, dents on the rim, scratches or other blemishes on the surface, how much luster they have versus how dull they are, and how much detail it has versus if it's all worn down. Even just touching a coin can deposit oils from your fingers that can damage the surface. So if a coin circulated a lot and it's really old, it probably looks pretty beat up. What's weird though is that cleaning all the years of dirt and grime off a coin might damage it and decrease its value. That said, I should also mention that storing coins in a box is not ideal because the coins bump up against each other in there and then they get dinged up and wear down faster. If you want to keep your collection safer, try to get some coin holders or just get something where you can keep them separated in different compartments. Luckily though, this isn't a high value collection. It's really just more sentimental and for fun. I do wonder what this collection would be worth though. Are you sitting on a treasure? Those couch cushions can really pay off. Don't just spend your coins. Learn if they're worth more than you think. 
If you want to know if your pile of coins can become a coin collection, the Fort Worth Public Library has great resources for you. For a limited time of whenever you have access to the Fort Worth Public Library, you can check out our special books about coin collecting. Order now and you can have Coins and Other Currency, a kid's guide to coin collecting. The fun doesn't stop here. Call in and check out Cool Coins, creating fun and fascinating collections. Did you know that coins aren't the only collectibles? You can also check out Baseball Card Pricing Guide. Make your cards into cash. Act fast and we'll throw in Keep the Change, a collector's tale of lucky pennies. Call 555-555-5555 and realize that's a fake number. Come on down to the Fort Worth Public Library and all of this can be yours for free. Did you know? Time out! Before you decide to spend your non-collectible coins, save one to help decide your next soccer game. At the start of every soccer game, a coin flip takes place. Per FIFA rules, each team designated captain meets with the head official, with one captain choosing heads or tails. The winning captain selects which goal their team will play towards for the half of the game. If you and your friends need to know who gets to go first, you can also flip a coin. Hey, what else can you do with coins? Try this. Today we're going to be talking about coin rubbings. So what you'll need to do this activity, you'll need to get a piece of paper. You can print out a coloring sheet with your own piggy bank or you can draw your own or a box or whatever you would like. You will also need your writing utensils. Uh, you can either use color pencils like I have here, crayons or pencils or whatever you would like. And most importantly, you are going to need your coins. I have a penny here which is worth one cent. I have a nickel here, which is worth five cents. And I have a dime here, which is worth 10 cents. And a quarter, which is worth 25 cents. So we're gonna get started with our penny first. Gonna take your coin, find a nice little spot under it, under the paper. And you're gonna pick a color. And you're gonna lightly shade over the coin. Can anybody tell me which president is on the penny? That's right, it's Abraham Lincoln. So Abraham Lincoln's looking pretty good so far. Let's go with our next coin. We're gonna get our nickel. Find a nice spot for the nickel here. Can anybody tell me which president is on the nickel? That's right, it is Thomas Jefferson. And you don't have to do this really perfect. It's just for practice, okay? Can you tell me which president is on the dime? That is absolutely correct. Franklin Roosevelt. I'm gonna shade him in here. Can you tell me which president is on the quarter? That's right, George Washington. And you'll just keep shading until you make out the faces and the numbers. All right, good job. So now we have all of our coins in our piggy bank. So let's count and see how much money we have. What is one plus five plus 10 plus 25? You're right, it equals 41 cents. Thank you for joining me today and Come back and see us for Learn, Dream, Do. Have a great day. Piggy banks have been around for a long time, but did you ever wonder why people thought to make their banks into the shape of a pig? 500 years ago, metal was very expensive. Dishes and pots were made of a type of inexpensive orange clay called pig. Back then there was not banks like we had today, so when people had extra coins to save, they would place them in a clay pot. People called the pots pig banks. Over time, what do you think that turned into? Yes, a piggy bank. Do you have extra coins at home? Where do you put them? Spend, share, and save. 
Now that we've talked about piggy banks, we can talk about some ways to make choices about the money that goes inside them. One way to choose how to spend your money is to divide it up into three buckets. This means we're dividing up the money into three categories. For me, money to spend on things you like. For you, money to give to a charitable cause. And for later, money to save for a rainy day or something expensive that you really, really want. Spend, share, and save. What's an example of something that goes in the spend category? It might be something little like a snack, such as an apple or mango. It could also be something that's under a specific amount. For example, if your allowance is $5 per week, then anything that costs less than $2 might be something that goes here. And the other $3 will be divided up into the share and save buckets. Or if the profits from your lemonade stand were $20, you might increase that spend now cap up to $8 because you've made enough money to spend a little more. When we buy something that goes in this category, it means that we should use the money that we set aside for spending right now. Now, let's think about something that goes into the share category. This can mean buying food and beds for cats and dogs at the animal shelter, buying food to share with others who don't have enough, or donating to a charity like the Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders to help other people in need. All right, we've talked about spend and share. Our last bucket is the save bucket. In here, we put all the money we want to save. The savings could be for a big purchase, like a cool new toy that you want, or it could be for a rainy day. It's helpful to make a habit of saving money, so in case something big does come up, you'll have enough set aside that you can still buy the things that you want or need. Spend, share, and save. If I walked into a store and asked if I could pay for my items using invisible money, the clerk would look at me and laugh. However, a lot of people do this every single day. When I go to the store, I pay for my items either using a plastic card or a contactless payment in my phone. Long ago, people would use seeds as a form of payment, but we sure have come a long way since then. Today, there's a lot of ways to use digital money, which we sometimes call cryptocurrency. Speaking of which, it looks like my friend just paid me back for lunch. That's the best part about using these methods of payments. They can be instantaneous and we don't have to be near each other. One important thing to remember though, is you have to have that money in your account or paid off each month. There's no such thing as free money. But it looks like the buck stops here for the Learn Dream Do show, but you can keep the fun going and learn more. Don't forget to check out these titles from our collection either on Overdrive or Curbside Pickup. Billy Surekid Entrepreneur by Luke Sharpie. Meet Billy Shore, a 12-year-old inventor and CEO of Sure Things Incorporated, and discover all his wacky and wild inventions. Cleo Edison Oliver, Playground Millionaire by Sandy Frazier. Cleo Edison Oliver wants to be just like her inspiration, a successful businesswoman named Fortune A. Davies. So she comes up with the best business idea yet, the finest tooth pulling company in town. Lunch Money by Andrew Clements. Greg Kenton is obsessed with making money and he's noticed that every day after lunch, kids usually have an extra quarter or two to spend. So how can he make that money? Comic books just might work. The Toothpaste Millionaire by Gene Morell. Rufus Mayflower sets out to make his own toothpaste in order to save a bit of money and ends up making a million. If you're looking for some non-fiction books, then check out these titles. The Teen Money Manual, a guide to cash, credit, spending, saving, work, wealth, and more. How to turn $100 into 1 million. Earn, save, invest. Better than a lemonade stand, small business ideas for kids. Did you know that the Bureau of Engraving and Printing is right here in Fort Worth? In the future, make sure to go take one of their free tours and watch the process of how money is made. The US Mint has an educational website for kids. Visit their website by pointing your web browsers to usmint.gov slash kids. uscurrency.gov is another great website to check out if you want to learn more about the life cycle of bills and coins, as well as learn about the current security features built into the seven denominations. Fun fact, did you know if you put a bill under a UV light, the security strip inside fluoresces? If you're ready to start your own financial journey, most banks offer a kid's banking account along with educational materials to help you learn how best to save and spend money. 
Smart habits start early, so if you want to learn about money confidence and financial capability, then check out the free Rooster Money app where you can keep track of your allowance and spending with its virtual money tracker. Well, if you're just joining us now, you're a day late and a dollar short. That's all for this week, but don't worry, we'll be back soon.